banks are getting scared. They're trying to change the rules so they don't go under. And for real, the other day, New York Community Bank woke up like this. Q Bank Failures 2024. And just a couple of days ago, they tried to pass this new rule about derivatives. And the implications are super spicy. Beneath some of the world's major cities lies a vast secret network, older than the cities themselves, and its purpose is not what you'd expect. Deep beneath the urban landscapes of cities like New York, Paris, and London, there exist layers of history that go beyond subway tunnels and utility lines. According to a whistleblower from an undisclosed government agency, these cities are built atop ancient networks of tunnels and chambers, part of a global system that predates modern civilization. It's scary. In the last week, a surprising 15 billionaires secretly made underground bunkers. Billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, OpenICO, Sam Altman, and even President Biden are in a rush to build their own bunkers. Yeah! Oh my God! Orlando and Oh my god! <laughs> Yo, he's not responding. Please, please. What am I? <laughs> what am I? <laughs> what am I? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Renee and you are watching Highly Motivated. Real quick, I want to say hello and thank you for coming back to all of my Highly Motivated family. I love you guys. And if you're new here, welcome. You're really going to enjoy today's show. I have a lot of videos to go over and a lot to talk about. So without further ado, let's get into today's video. We have been following this young woman and I guess we could call it her obsession with the Fruit of the Loom and whether the cornucopia was part of their logo in the past or not. She has since found t-shirts that have the logo, but now the plot actually thickens. They're suddenly getting taken down all out of the blue. The weird thing is it's every video where I mention Fruit of the Loom. Not a single other video. So darn strange, I can't figure it out. At least appreciate the irony of it being taken down for integrity. In all fairness, they do have a right to be upset at me because I did make a false claim. They had not yet acquired the company at the time that there was the feed mix-up with the fire retardant. They were only responsible when they lost 11 million gallons of wastewater due to their negligence. Maybe mistakes like that could be avoided if it wasn't so strangely difficult to find any information about the acquisition this is the only place i can even find the year anyways massive chemical contaminations happen to the best of us i'm just curious about what happened next i think you'd want to take care of a big old mess like that but instead you settled for 42 million knowing that the cost of cleanup would be much more than that and maybe that was the best you could do but i find that hard to believe when you were simultaneously selling your business for over 800 million dollars to warren buffett somehow during this deal you convinced the government that these companies with billions of dollars shouldn't have to pay anything else and instead the taxpayers aka the people you poison should have to pay instead which is extra bonkers when you consider that fruit of the loom turned it into the most expensive super fun site in america i'd love to say that fruit of the looms poisoning people's days are behind it but they actually have bpas in their clothes and these are the side effects of bpas in 2021 you were legally informed these bpas were present and have been since 2018 One of the requirements set forth was to recall any of the bpa products but personally i can't find a single recall i want to be nice and assume that notice got mixed up with all their other documents i can't find but i really like this article by vanity fair written in 2008 10 years before fruit of the loom was notified about their bpas where they acknowledge that it's linked to cancer they then go on to say that regardless of what the fda says is legal it's a company's responsibility to test their products for safety too bad fruit of the loom didn't have access to that information at the time but wait a minute this isn't adding up because fruit of the loom owns vanity fair Fruit of the Loom, if I have my facts wrong, I'm happy to take my video down. All you have to do is ask me and give me a detailed explanation on what really happened. As always, I'm just a silly little gal making a silly little video with no credentials. This is purely for entertainment purposes and everything I said could just be a big old lie. Those are suddenly... And maybe we would have just let it go and thought that it was a lie or her exaggerating her fun little obsession. But now you are taking down videos. Is, is there something you don't want us paying attention to?
This next man went to get a bowl of cereal and got more than he bargained for. So I poured it out in my bowl and out comes uh, this paper that was all folded up just like this. The note contains a mashup of words and references to current events and conspiracy theories. Miller says his big concern is that somehow a note made its way into a sealed food product. I don't know what's inside the cereal or if this note was laced with anything. It's not the note that really bothers me, it's just what was, it's, uh, these notes are found inside food. So I poured it out in my bowl. If somebody can find a picture of what one of those notes says, I would love to see it. Um, it'd be great if somebody could break down all the codes because there's got to be something in code on it. Why would you go through the problem or the, the trouble of sealing a note into something in pro during production if it doesn't mean anything? I mean, unless you're just trying to troll whoever bought it. That's a lot of effort for nothing, though. There's Brittany, Madonna, Beyonce, whoever that is looks possessed, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande. Y'all wondering how I found those pictures. I did some deep, deep searching. For food products and I ran across those pictures and Ooh. I'm like dang the how did these pictures end up on the internet them NDAs must be a spy cuz that's crazy they saying this for photos for play but why would you put it out there like that I'm just saying you know, they can call it art, but art is an individual thing. When y'all are doing the same hand motions, the same signals, that is not art. You're obviously doing something symbolic. Beneath some of the world's major cities lies a vast secret network older than the cities themselves, and its purpose is not what you'd expect. Deep beneath the urban landscapes of cities like New York, Paris, and London, there exist layers of history that go beyond subway tunnels and utility lines. According to a whistleblower from an undisclosed government agency, these cities are built atop ancient networks of tunnels and chambers, part of a global system that predates modern civilization. These hidden networks are said to be remnants of a prehistoric civilization, far advanced in ways we can't comprehend. The whistleblower who provided cryptic maps and documents claims these tunnels are not just historical relics. They are part of a still active global surveillance system. What's more, the story suggests that select government officials and elite members of society have access to this network. They use it for rapid, undetected travel between cities and to convene in secret, discussing matters that shape the world's future. Anomalies in satellite imagery have occasionally revealed unusual heat signatures and electromagnetic readings emanating from beneath these cities, lending credibility to these claims. Some urban explorers have reported finding sealed entrances in forgotten subway tunnels and basements, but these are quickly covered up. The true purpose of this network remains a mystery. Is it merely an ancient transportation system, or does it serve a more sinister purpose? Could it be an elaborate surveillance network, or perhaps something even more extraordinary? So, next time you walk the busy streets of a major city, consider what secrets might lie just beneath your feet. What is the hidden purpose of these ancient networks, and why is it guarded so closely? Beneath... Well, I could think of some pretty nefarious reasons why you would need something like that. I have read that there is a tram or monorail type thing under the ground. They can get from one end of the country to the other in under an hour. And it's said that these underground tunnels are, are used more for trafficking than anything else. And... What better way to do something right under everyone's noses without them seeing what's going on? And I also believe 
when we see these videos of people hearing strange things like trumpet sounding or like weird machinery i i'm i fully think it's something that's taking place under the ground that they're hearing and it's just echoing what do you guys think let me know in the comments now this next video is a little bit on the long side but it's extremely relevant and i think it's important that um people see what's going on behind the scenes right now when it comes to our banking system the banks are getting scared they're trying to change the rules so they don't go under i'm We've for real the other day before. new york community bank woke up like this q bank failures 2024 and just a couple of days ago they tried to pass this new rule about derivatives and the implications are super spicy so a quick refresher derivatives meaning like bets in the stock market that can go completely hog wild um, are what caused 2008 to collapse. It was one specific type of derivative that they were super hyped on at the time, but derivatives in general allow for banks to just go absolutely fucking ape shit with all kinds of speculation on huge amounts of leverage. So if they're wrong, if things go badly, the whole economy can collapse. And after it almost did, Obama signed this wonderful bill called Dodd-Frank that totally was gonna change everything. He said, quote, Wall Street reform, Dodd-Frank, the laws that we have passed worked. It's popular in the media and political discourse, both on the left and the right, to suggest that the crisis happened and nothing changed. That is not true. Sorry, I should be doing my Obama voice. That is not true. We are moving in the derivative sector. A huge amount of oversight. Fuck that. We don't have time for all that in his voice. Basically, the idea was all these derivatives that are just shady backdoor deals, banks betting with other banks without telling anyone else what they're betting on with huge amounts of money that is not all theirs. A lot of it doesn't even exist because they're banking on leverage. Obama promised that they were all gonna come into the light and be traded on exchanges so we could regulate them and everything would be safe from here right. on out. And that is why, as of the most recent report, JP Morgan is holding $58 trillion worth of derivatives, closely followed by Goldman Sachs and Citibank. For a little perspective here, I took the GDP of all of the biggest countries in the world and I put them on this cute little chart scaled in trillions of dollars. And if you add up every country except the US, all these ones highlighted in red, then you get that blue bar, $55 trillion. That's all of them except the US added together. Remember, gross domestic product. Everything that those countries, the, all of these countries combined creates a value in an entire year. And that red bar is JP Morgan alone, how much derivatives they are currently holding open. Just wow. For scale. But Obama told us that don't worry, they're gonna do, it's not gonna be dangerous, they're gonna be all regulated and out in the open market and it's gonna be safe. And that is why as of the most recent reporting last year, 96% of JP Morgan's trades are over the counter, meaning in dark markets where they are not regulated and they are not reported. Only 3% of their derivatives contracts traded on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange. And this is for every single bank. Some of them are 100% over the counter. This is the exact opposite of what Obama told us they were gonna do with the derivatives market. And shocker, derivatives got so popular into 2008. And what happened next? Nothing. They stayed really popular because this is the number one way for banks and big rich financial institutions to take our money. And they've already been shown that when they fuck up, they get bailed out. And that brings us to this new regulation that they just tried to get through. And who never gets bailed out? The little guy. You and me, our parents, we just get to struggle along. For all you dipshits out there that are always trying to be like, this is notional value. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, we know what notional value is, guys. Sit tight while we learn about this new rule because notional value matters. I first caught wind of this just a few days ago when this Reddit user, what can I make today, posted and broke this whole bill down. If you Google what you're seeing on the screen here, you can find this post. And yes, I went and corroborated what he's claiming on the official government websites. The law itself is a long document with a whole bunch of legalese that's very confusing. But basically what it's saying is, when the markets are really crazy, how about if we just let the big banks like, kind of, well, it's really crazy, let's just not margin call them. See, when the banks or anyone places derivative bets on the market, they have to have a certain amount of collateral just in case the trade goes wrong. 
particularly because all of these trades are being done on margin, meaning money they don't actually have. But sometimes the market does crazy things and gets what we call volatile. And they're worried that that could threaten the stability of its members during periods of heightened volatility. Jeez, oh, by imagine the way if you and I got a protection like that. You know, just in case the market's a little volatile, we'll just put a little protection where we don't have to actually pay. Like, <laughs> what the frick? Hey, it's members, referring to the OCC. This is their member directory. We're talking people like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Vanguard, Virtue, Instanet, Usual Citigroup, suspects. Bank of America, NASDAQ, you get the idea. Not you, you filthy peasant. And they're worried that if the market gets crazy, a sudden extreme increase in margin requirements could stress one of their members' ability to obtain liquidity to meet its obligations, particularly in periods of high volatility. I can't imagine why they would be expecting extreme volatility in the markets soon. So they're proposing changing the rules so that when the markets go crazy, all the biggest players just get a free pass on right. having their bets going wrong. Not you, though. Marge right. will call you so fucking fast. They specifically <laughs> refer to what happened with GameStop as an example of why they should all not have to deal with all this market volatility and should get a free pass on having a ton of risky bets and not having enough margin to cover them. Remember how much risky betting we're talking about here. Remember that it is 96 traded over the counter, meaning unregulated and unchecked. What they are specifically concerned about is something called counterparty risk. Because all these hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives, they are not all just open trades that if you get it wrong, you lose all the money. It's a bunch of hedges and balances back and forth. And when they open a position for someone in this direction, they open their own position in the other direction to cover their asses. It's all very complicated. Yes, to all the Not haters, purpose. we know what notional value means. Y'all need to learn what counterparty risk means. Like Bill Huang learned real quick. See, back around when GameStop happened, Bill was doing a whole bunch of kind of secret over-the-counter trading of really high derivatives with a bunch of money that he didn't exactly have. In You know, like the exact same thing the banks are doing on those sheets I'm showing you. But the problem is once his trades kind of started to go a little wrong and then like the GameStop thing happened and all the markets were crazy and he just kind of lost control of like the margin in his portfolio. And his firm went bankrupt pretty damn quick. But the problem is that the counterparty to almost all of his trades was Credit Suisse. And the moment that his firm, Archegos, ceased to exist, suddenly Credit Suisse was holding all of these trades open with no one on the other side to fulfill meaning what were balanced, hedged positions one day, okay. the very next day were complete YOLOs, just like balls deep into whatever directions Bill had left them on the hook for. And if you didn't know, Credit Suisse is not with us anymore. Yeah, bye-bye. Largely because of Bill and Archegos. All of these hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivative risk rely on no one going bankrupt because if any one of these big players gets into trouble everyone else's bets are completely fucked and that is why they're trying to argue that they should all get a pass on margin calls more or less when there's times of extreme market volatility because like that's just weird random stuff that's like you know like when the market doesn't play by the rules we just like get a little pass until the rules are back on right because like you know we're big we're good guys so if you want to know more, you can search out this post by searching the title on the screen. This is in Super Stonk on Reddit. Homie wrote up an awesome summary, and then he even wrote a sample comment letter that you can submit if you want to submit comments that they're not expecting because the poors are not supposed to get involved. So if you want to keep right. takeaway here, politicians work for the banks. The regulators work for the banks. Most of it's self-regulated anyways. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that you also work for the banks, corporate income taxes, individual income taxes, and the entire global monetary system is leveraged to the absolute tits. And we might be in the process of watching our very first bank failure of the year, but probably not our last. This new rule tells me that they're expecting lots of volatility coming up, and that's why the banks are getting scared. They're Something tells me we are in for a very interesting couple of years when it comes to our financial system. This whole too big to fail thing is getting a little old because when this happened in 2008, 
They were bailed out. And according to what he says, they went on to create even more egregious leverages and hedges and things that they couldn't actually pay for. So now if something does happen, we're set up to where dominoes are just going to. And and I wonder, and uh, less than wonder, I, I'm pretty sure this was all part of a design um destroying the economy of the world i used to say just it was just the u.s they wanted to but it seems like it's happening all over there are tent cities in canada it's not just the u.s there are immigration problems and open borders all over the world. It's happening in Europe. So sometimes I run into these channels on TikTok where the majority of their videos seem to be kind of AI generated, but the topics are always something conspiracy related. But what's weird is a lot of these channels, after like about a week, they just kind of disappear so I kind of have this theory that some of these channels are created by three-letter agencies to specifically put out different theories that are completely ridiculous to keep people going down false rabbit holes to keep them away from the real ones. And this one is kind of one of those, in my opinion. I want to know what you think. The warnings of a time traveler from the year 2671 about 2024 are downright haunting. He has warned us about four alarming dates. So save this video so you can keep track of these dates and see if they were right. Let's start they with never January are. 23rd. <laughs> On January 23rd, 2024, humanity... Oh, well, that already passed, so let's see what this one was supposed to be. <laughs> ...discovers an underground civilization called the Splitting World, living beneath the Earth's crust, but contact is made through a message declaring their intent to wage war against people on the surface. On March 7th, 2024, an Earth-sized planet is discovered in our solar system oh, that is found to be a mirror version of our world, with right. opposite gravity, purple waters, and red plants, yet still habitable, making it a bizarre yet intriguing mirror twin to our own Earth. On April 15th, SpaceX successfully developed a method for spaceships to reach light speed only to unexpectedly encounter hostile alien life forms who learn of the breakthrough <laughs> and want to take the new light engine technology for themselves, posing potential risks. Finally, on June 29, 197, mysterious statues suddenly materialized in every country around the world, which are then discovered to have been covertly installed by unknown aliens to both observe and frighten humanity as some kind of social experiment or prelude to an invasion after their leader See? Mitch succeeded in his malign plans against Earth. Okay, and you notice that there's like an alien theme? I feel like they're really pushing this alien deception because they want people to believe that they are aliens and not fallen angels and demons. There is now a phenomena known as the 2020 effect. How well do you remember the year 2020? Because a lot of people don't remember a bunch of major events that happened that year. A lot of people mention that 2020 feels like a big dream. There's a theory called the 2020 effect and the isolation due to the pandemic has caused a lot of people to just forget about 2020 entirely. A lot of people hardly remember having to wear face masks everywhere we went. The toilet paper hoarding, and the extreme price gouging on hand sanitizer. A lot of people don't remember the monoliths, George Floyd, and the BLM protests, the mystery seeds that were received in Texas, or the Subway yoga mat sandwiches. A lot of people don't remember ever being on edge as we waited for that asteroid to possibly hit Earth. Mike Lindell's meltdown over the 2020 election, the invasion of the murder hornets, or the fire NATO. Many of these events have people scratching their heads. Or they kind of remember these things happening, but it didn't feel like it was four years ago. 2020 was a year to remember, but a lot of people can't even do that. How well? What do you think? Do you remember the majority of the things that she named? The only one that I don't remember is the yoga mat subway sandwiches. That's a, that's a new one on me. 
I kind of feel like it's less that people are forgetting specifics and more that it's just that there's so much that just continues to happen. It's like you barely get over one thing before there's more. It's like we're overloaded with information and and disasters and, and things we're supposed to care about or be sad about or fight for. Like people are exhausted. What is the thing that stands out the most to you about your time at home during 2020? French Montana shared on his Instagram account that 15 billionaires are building bunkers these past few weeks. Don't you find that weird? It's scary. In the last week, a surprising 15 billionaires secretly made underground bunkers. Billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, OpenICO, Sam Altman, and even President Biden are in a rush to build their own bunkers. People who think about conspiracy theories don't believe that this is just a coincidence. So what do these super rich folks seem to know that we don't? With tensions worldwide really high, some think it's connected to possible chaos everywhere. Are billionaires getting ready for an economic collapse, natural disaster, or even nuclear war? It's extremely suspicious. One thing is clear. These bunkers are not just for show. They're high-tech shelters filled with years of supplies. But what's the scary threat that has the powerful people so worried? Some think it's just paranoid panic, but could billionaires really be getting inside warnings about a coming catastrophe? If the richest people are now looking for shelter, should the rest of us start making our own plans just in case french montana shared on his instagram account they went from buying beachfront property to building underground bunkers i'm sorry but i cannot think of these rich people in their underground bunkers without thinking of the verse when they're going to be crying for the rocks to fall on them Apparently, during the Grammys, there was a literal blood ritual. Okay, so here's the most innocent up-and-coming star in the whole music industry, Olivia Rodrigo, and there's Satan incarnate. And you are going to watch this innocent little flower start rubbing blood all over her fucking face and chest. <laughs> uh, she sings about a demon vampire sticking his teeth into her neck and sucking the blood out from under her. This is obviously her sacrifice song. Uh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, Olivia, you're gone. You're the lost cause. And then blood just starts fucking pouring from the fucking walls. And you can tell in the background, those are supposed to be like platelets, right? Like blood in a microscope. Like this is like the cutest little, like 20 year old little angel in all of music. And she's performing. And I'm, I, I'm sorry, I have to pause it because they hate copyright music and even if I like pause it for a second and just say like one word, it's not enough for them. So we're going to say about 20 in between just so we can get through this video. Rubbing blood on her fucking face as blood pours from the walls and she sings about bleeding out. I mean. She must be the next on the list to be big and famous. Just and also, did you catch how they had Taylor Swift singing along to her song and they made sure to get a picture of that? That right there is a sign or a, a symbolic as well because it's almost... Uh, Taylor co-signing that her music is good in a way. They never introduce one of these new stars without first having them be co-signed or humiliated by someone else in the industry. Remember when it happened to Taylor I'm let with you Kanye? Finish, but he thing. that whole. Keep an eye open because that's probably what's next for her. Before we had things like flu shots, in 1959, they 
the BBC interviewed people on their cures for the flu. And their answers are pretty interesting. Well, I take vitamin C and lemon barley and whiskey. Well, I start the day with a good hot breakfast. Porridge, eggs and bacon and a drop of whiskey and tea. You can defy the virus then. Ah, eh? very good. What about you, madam? I believe in a good breakfast, but I also believe if you have got the flu, rinse your inside out with, uh, continually with boiled water, about four or five half pint glasses a day, boiled water. Well, my remedy for flu is to uh, get a small Spanish onion, chop it up finely, and uh, put some brown sugar over it and a little vinegar. And then when it's into a syrup, take a spoonful before you go to bed. It's a very good remedy. Well, I'm a great believer in whiskey. I'm like the Scotchman. I believe in a drop of whiskey warm, and it, it, it sort of cures the germs. I think broad onions are marvellous idea. <laughs> What's your <laughs> recipe? Cute. A jolly good hot rum punch, you and a jolly, jolly good, good hot rum punch. Bed till it's all over. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> well, uh, my mother recommends an old sweaty sock, <laughs> to talk about, around your throat, good pullover, and a good hot water bottle, and sweat it out, and then if you feel that you're not going to spread germs around, then get up. Well, I think it's quite a, a simple ailment to deal with. Uh -huh. I take a jolly good dose of salts and let nature do, do the rest. Well, the best way that we find, and the only way, uh, is the use of elderflower wine. If you take a good uh, glassful tonight and uh, you go to bed and you sweat it out, you know, and you're all right in the day too. Well. Do you notice that so far no one has said, well, I go to the pharmacy and I buy a drug and I take it. Every single one has a natural remedy that was probably passed down to them. There is a good cure in mustard and lard and you rub the two well together and get a good blend in and then after it's re really, I don't know how to do it, but my father does it. But does he eat it or does he rub no, it into his rub chest? No, it or? on your chest in the front and back. Oh. And it is a, it is a good cure. I see. How about you? Have you got a good cure? Mm -hmm. Goose grease. You can rub that on your chair, you know, after you've been cooking a goose, and then keep the grease and uh, <laughs> rub it on your chair. The goose is cooked. A large sheet of brown paper and cut it to go under the arms. Yes. And do, uh, you warm it first mm -hmm. and get hot, uh, a, a warm goose grease. Mm -hmm. So as the and uh, spread mustard over the. Is this a paper recipe? First, mm -hmm. yes. anyway, is she cooking or is this for her health? Get warm goose grease, which um, most people have got in the house. You spread it over the mustard on the paper to avoid any burning of the skin. I see. And should inflammation be setting in, as the doctor says it does sometimes, you boil the uh, boil elderflower. Mm. and give the patient a dose of the elderflower water. I see. But That's then you two go... on the elderflower water. A bit of bed with this on, this yes, brown paper? Yes, yes. And the goose grease avoids it from burning. Oh. Don't you brown find paper. it a bit messy? Oh, well, you've got to spread that. You've got to put up with that, haven't you? Well, if I feel as if the flu is coming on me, I take a nice big tumbler full of hot lemonade, put in about three teaspoonfuls of rum, two aspirins, get into bed, cover myself up well, tie the stocking that I've been wearing on my feet, one of them, around my throat, with a safety pin, and stay in bed and sweat it out. And in the morning, change my pajamas and stay in the bed. And then again, I do it again, and that's once in the afternoon, once again at night, and I find in three days' time, I'm cured. What do you find? You know, it's funny because how many of us could take three days off of their job to get rid of their flu without getting in trouble today? The best Not many. way to cure the flu would just think that you haven't got it. And <laughs> better than that, boil onion. Yes. Just think that you don't have it or boiling onion and you're going to be just fine, guys. Here we have a testimony from a woman who claims that she was a witch and uh, she is going to tell us some of her encounters that she had with the demonic when she was practicing witchcraft. 
So during my time as a witch, before Jesus saved me, I experienced things that number one, you would never believe in a million years, or number two, you believe wholeheartedly because you've experienced something similar. I'm gonna tell you guys about one of those things today. I might turn this into a series, but today we'll just start with this one. When I was around 13 years old, I got out of the church. I had grown up in the Brethren Church. The church that I went to was very legalistic, very ritualistic, very religious. And by 13 years old, my parents allowed me to have the choice to go or not, and I said no. I said, that cannot be what God is like, and if it is, I don't want nothing to do with it, I'm out. At the same time, I got into a very abusive relationship that lasted for about seven years. It was physically abusive, emotionally abusive, sexually, mentally, physically, emotionally. I'm sure I said one of those twice. It was a lot. Like I said, that lasted for seven years, and at the end of it, I had come to the end of myself. I had lost all identity. I had lost any bit of self-worth that I ever had. I just truly felt absolutely worthless, unlovable, and without identity. Now for this all to make sense, I have to give you a little bit of back information. My grandmother, my whole life, spoke a word curse over me that I would one day become a witch, that I had power, that I shouldn't avoid it, that I shouldn't be scared of it, and that I should just embrace it. These things were true. I experienced a lot of things my whole life that nobody else did. I saw things, I heard things, I felt things that nobody else did, and I could never put a name on it until I was 15 years old and took on the identity of a witch for myself. At 15, I got my first spell book and I dove very deep into the craft, searching for an identity after a relationship that left me feeling like I had none. So we're going to fast what forward about seven, doing? eight years. She was trying to fill a void. I know some don't like to hear this, but we were created to worship. And if you're not putting God as your head, there's something in your life that's more important. And when you want to call it worship or not, you are putting something in your life on a pedestal. I'm a younger adult. I am living out of my parents' house now. I have a house of my own and I have a roommate. My roommate at the time was an amazing Christian woman. She still is. I still love her so much. That was her little shout out. But I was so far from Jesus. I was so far from God. And so when we were living in this house, I was experiencing the deepest, darkest, demonic torment that you could physically imagine. I mean, I, I could truly only fathom these things in the depths of hell and I was living in it every day. I was seeing things and hearing things. I was feeling like I was going insane. I would be looking around like this every once in a while. My friends would be like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, you didn't see that? I was being led by spirit guides at the time that were telling me to do awful things and that started to be really mean and hateful and they weren't like that when I started to channel them and so I started to question. I would be woken up every single night by demonic torment, either one of two things, number one, sleep paralysis, or number two, a panic attack. And this happened every single night for a year and a half at 3 a.m. I'm sure I'm not the first person that you've heard say that. And there is a reason for that, 3 a.m. mocks the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so there was one night that I woke up, 3 a.m., not unusual for me. Like I said, this happens every night and I was having a panic attack. And I was so used to it at this point that I was just kind of sitting there. I learned to just sit in it and, you know, there was nothing I could do but just sit in it and work through it. Um, and my phone rang and I was like, what the heck is going on? My roommate's calling me. Now, like I said, it's typical for me to be awake, but for her to be awake is very unusual. So I answer the phone and I'm like, what are you doing awake? And she said, you need to come in here right now. I'm like are you good? Are we good? What's going on? Why? Why are you awake? Why do you need me to come into your room? She said, I need you to come in here right now. There is somebody in my room. And so I'm like, there's somebody in your room, in my house. You're calling me on the phone. What? What is going on? Like, I was so confused. I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. You're calling me. There's somebody standing in your room. What is going on? So I'm like sprinting to her room. Like, Having a panic attack already, I'm panicked. I am like full of anxiety. I'm full of fear. I am literally drenched in demonic spirits. And I'm running to her room. As soon as I open the door, I remember seeing her face and I will never be able to unsee it. I will never forget what it looked like. I had never seen her face that pale. I had never seen her look so terrified in her life. And I had never seen somebody look at me as if I were not standing there and they were just looking right through me. As soon as I walked in the door and she saw me, her head went like this. She told me that the man that was standing in her room, the demon that was standing in her room, fled when I walked in the room. When I cracked the door open and she saw me, she saw the demon go from one part of her room out the window on the other side of the room. I asked God why this was later on in my walk and the thing that he told me shook me to my core. I said, God, why did that happen? all those years ago I remember being in that room and I remember her being so terrified and the look that she gave me and then the demon just left like why did that happen 
And he told me that demon no longer needed to be in her room when you entered it. And if that doesn't show you what kind of demonic spirits were attached to me, what kind of spiritual authority the demonic spirits that were on me had, that demonic spirit that was in her room didn't need to be there if I was there. I remember staying up with her that night for a little bit and just like sitting in her room with her and being like, nothing's here. Like, I didn't see anything. You're safe. We're okay. And meanwhile, she knew that I was bringing all kinds of stuff into our home. I mean, my home in the middle of our living room, I had a case, like a chest or drawer full of crystals and tarot cards and spell books and Ouija material and witchcraft paraphernalia just like displayed in our living room. She knew as a Christian that I was bringing things into that home. She just didn't know how to handle all of the demonic forces that were surrounding us because of the things that I was doing. And honestly, neither did I. It was literally the next day that she called my friend Alexa, who was her friend at the time as well, and now my best friend, the woman who led me to the Lord, and she told her about what happened. So that day, Alexa drove 30 minutes to our house. Donna and Alexa had anointing oil, they had their Bibles, and they were ready to war. Now keep in mind, I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life, okay? Through the whole entire time I was at church, the whole time I had been a witch at that point, seven, eight years, I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. These women rain down on hell. They plead the blood over every inch of that house. They anoint every inch of that house. They read scripture, Psalm 91, over every inch of that house. They cast it and commanded every single demon that was holding space in that house to go in the name of Jesus. They opened doors, opened windows, yes. and with every single breath they took, the demon in that house was taking its last at least its last breath Amen. in that house this was a pivotal point in my life because i saw how the name of jesus made demons flee i saw how demons were scared of the name of jesus and i saw how they obeyed i saw how they surrendered to his authority and after seeing that i wanted to know the man that was behind that name little yep. did i know that man was going to change my life but not yet but not yet because I hadn't learned yet it wasn't a few days later girlfriend that i was sitting on my couch meditating and had a demonic encounter should i make a part two let me know the spirit world is a very real thing. You do not want to be messing with demonic spirits. And like she said, in the beginning, they were nice. They are not going to be negative at first. They have to get you to create that tacit agreement. Once she made the agreement with them, all bets were off. That's when they started terrifying her because she did not know the control that she had over that relationship. It wasn't until her Christian friends were involved and she was able to see what pleading Jesus and having the name of Jesus and being a member of the body of Christ, the power that you have. Jesus is the final authority over everything. While they weren't wrong about everything, but can you imagine if your bed flung you out in the morning? <laughs> All right, time to get out. Now, this video is a little bit on the long side as well. This person was investigating a ball and then found a couple of other things that are really interesting during his investigation. And so let's listen. When investigating ball worship, I noticed a pattern. We pointed it out in another video, but didn't know why the pattern was so important. Here is a review of the pattern followed by why I feel it is so common. 
left foot forward and right hand in the air in every statue that we see here the Baphomet Statue of Liberty the pattern is everywhere Thanks to a clue, I think I know why we see this pattern. All right. The tower was about heights. The Orion connection. It appears Orion was important to them, but the connection is much deeper. I became aware that the ancient cultures were obsessed with Orion. Oddly enough, there are many similarities between them, even though they are located thousands of miles apart. And were supposedly made at different times. And many of them seem to have a major common interest when it comes to the Belt of Orion. Honestly, when looking into this topic, things kept getting weirder and weirder. With the ancient alien agenda being pushed at every turn, it's pretty obvious that there's more to this than we are being told. Not only did they worship Orion enough to create pyramids and statues for him, they're now Orion using Orion to Earth deceive another generation of people about our father's the creation. views of our blue marble in the blackness of space now capturing the imagination of a new generation yeah the imagination the good news is we can prove or we can use Orion to prove that the world isn't wobbling through space the Potter's Clay will show you how to do this. Let's take a look at Orion as if we were standing on the equator. Orion sits directly above the equator 365 days a year. The star Mintaka, in particular, almost sits exactly on the equational line, or equatorial line, no matter what time it is. Or what day it is. The sun is moving and Orion is not. When he changes the dates by month, watch how far above and below the equator the sun moves while Orion's belt remains fixed on the equator. Wow. The sun's all over. That's fascinating. If a tilted ball was causing the sun to move above and below the equator like it does, then Orion would also move in a similar path. Yep. 
Mintaka stays in the equator all year. Polaris is stationary all year. We now have two reference points that prove it's the sun in motion and not if us. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And he uses the small things of this world to confine, confound the wise. Heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And that's it. There is no possible way that the star in Orion and Polaris would be completely immovable while the sun is doing this. Show me on a heliocentric model where that works. Oh, wait. So all of the thousands of astronauts for 60 years are lying. Well, according, according to astronomy.com, only 667 people have journeyed to a, you know, an altitude of 50 miles, which is nothing. That's not space. 24 have been to the moon and 12 has actually walked on it. Here's something I want you just to think about, okay? Without judgment, just think about this. The moon is 238,000 miles away, right? Have you heard of something called the Van Allen Belt? It's a zone of energetic charged particles, most of which originate from the solar wind, okay? This is a belt that is a round. This is in between us and the moon. So it goes us, the Van Allen Belt, and the moon. The Van Allen Belt starts at about 400 miles and goes to 36,000 miles. This is pretty close, way, way more close compared to the moon. Do you know how hot it gets at this level? Okay, the regions in the Van Allen Belt go from 2,000 to 20,000 Kelvin. Well, what's Kelvin? 2,000 Kelvin equals 3,100 degrees. 20,000 Kelvin equals 35,000 degrees. 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Are you still with me? The Eagle Lunar Module used in the Apollo program was built mostly and completely of aluminum. So you're telling me that the aluminum in the ship alone can stand the 35,000 degree temperature when the space shuttle thermal protection system can only withstand 3,000 degrees. Okay, so the, the lowest number in the Van Allen belt will melt the thermal protection system. So you're telling me that this shuttle was able to traverse 30,000 miles of temperatures up to 35,000 degrees and still be able to make it to the moon, which is still over 200,000 miles away. The entry orbiter itself is made of reinforced carbon. Reinforced carbon melts at 3,600 degrees. Its boiling point is at 4,200 degrees, and the Van Allen belt reaches 35,000 degrees. So they would have to go <laughs> through a radiation belt that would melt them, yet they had somehow a way to make it to the moon, and then were able to transmit a viable signal through this Van Allen belt that's 30,000 miles wide with temperatures up to 35,000 degrees. And you're telling me back in 1960, we could watch that television live without any interruption? And here I am losing my signal every time a, a plane flies over me. Oh, but it's because they have the satellites in space, right? So in 1960, they had the satellite that could beam through the Van Allen belt, which is at 600 miles up. Yet the moon which is another 200 and something thousand miles away, 
the ship was able to make it through 35,000 degrees of temperature when it's boiling point just for its the carbon within it is only 4,200 degrees. You're telling me that these thousands of astronauts went and then lied. Actually, no, 24 went to the moon and only 12 walked on it. Do you know how easy it is to control 24 people, especially when you have a lot of money to do it? Yeah. yeah. NDA is anyone? Yeah. We totally went to the moon. Totally. Go ahead and think on what I said without any judgment in your mind. And you <laughs> tell me how the ship of NASA's just survived a 35,000 degree Van Allen belt. There is no getting through Allen. None. There's no getting through it. No way. Not even the signal. We did not have the technology back then to get that signal through that Van Allen belt. Plain and simple. Go back to NASA and ask them to explain that one to you. But supposedly, not only did we have that technology, but we lost it and we can't recreate it. <laughs> Our last video for today features body cam footage from an incident where an infant is choking and they cannot get him to start breathing, but the officer does not give up. to forget that wow before i let you go i have had a few of you ask me about jesus and different questions about being saved 
And so I quickly wanted to share with you the best summary that is found in our Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And this summarizes exactly what you need to be saved today. So if you do nothing else, listen to this. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's it. It's that simple. If you are not sure where to start, Start here, and I promise you, Jesus will lead you the rest of the way. I love you guys. I hope you all have an amazing weekend, and I will see you at the beginning of next week. Until next time, stay prayed up and stay highly motivated.